Shall we carry on? Might as well carry on now. Let's do that then. Uh, so now we come to the last of the assemblies, uh, and uh, this is how it goes. Uh, suppose there was a sweltering forest grove uh, not far from a town or a village, uh, and there was a tree laden with fruit, yet none of the fruit had fallen to the ground. Uh, and along came a person in need of fruit, uh, wandering in search of fruit. Uh, Having plunged deep inside that forest grove, uh, they'd see that tree laden with fruit. Uh, they would think, uh, that tree is laden with fruit, uh, yet none of the fruit has fallen to the ground. Uh, but I know how to climb a tree. Why don't I climb the tree, eat as much as I like, then fill my pouch? And that's what they would do now. And along would come a second person in need of fruit, wandering in search of fruit, carrying a sharp axe. Having plunged deep into that forest grove, they would see that tree laden with fruit. They would think, yeah, that tree is laden with fruit, yet none of the fruit has fallen to the ground. But I don't know how to climb a tree. Why don't I chop this tree down at the root, eat as much as I like, then fill my pouch? And so, they would chop the tree down at the root. The other guy is in the top, and he's chopping down at the bottom, so you can imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think, householder, if the first person who climbed the tree doesn't quickly come down, when that tree fell, wouldn't they break their hand or arm or other limb, result in death or death-like suffering for them? Yes, sir. <laughs> In the same way, a noble disciple reflects with the simile of the fruit tree. The Buddha said that sensual pleasures give little gratification and much suffering and distress, and they are all the more full of drawbacks. So this is the simile of the fruit tree. And uh, what does it mean? Uh, the idea here is that uh, you are wandering in a sweltering forest, right? Uh, in a sweltering forest with trees everywhere around you. This might be a jungle or whatever it is. In that sweltering forest, you don't see very far. You're kind of blinded by all the trees around you. And this is like the five sense world. We're wandering around in the five sense world. They're yeah, looking around at all the kind of beautiful things that are exist, trying to avoid all the bad things in that five sense world. But we cannot see very far. We are hindered by the five senses. Uh, our mind is kind of locked in by those five senses. Uh. And as we wander around in this forest, we're always looking out for nice things. Yeah, nice things to buy, nice things to kind of to, to enjoy, yeah, a nice partner, a nice meal, a nice house, a nice whatever it is, uh, a nice job, yeah, all of these things. We're walking around, looking around, yeah. And then uh, as we're walking around this forest, uh, and we come across something nice. Oh, a nice fruit tree. Yeah, a mango tree. Yeah, the mangoes are ripe. Yeah, and so you climb that mango tree here yeah, to get some of those mangoes to eat as much as you like. Yeah, yeah when mangoes are just right, yeah, they're very delicious. Yeah. If, is anyone here who doesn't like mangoes? Yeah. Everyone likes mangoes. Yeah, this is kind of almost universal. Very hard to find people who don't like mangoes, yeah. especially when they're just right. Yeah. And so you climb that tree and you eat those mangoes. Uh, yeah. And what happens when you're eating mangoes? Uh, well, because mangoes are delicious, uh, because the five sense world is full of these things that always tempt us, uh, we lose our mindfulness. Uh, we lose our awareness of what is going on. Uh, we get intoxicated. Uh, the five sense world is intoxicating. Uh. In the Buddhist teaching, or in life in general, we think that intoxication is just about alcohol and drugs. But actually in Buddhism, intoxication is about much more than alcohol and drugs. You can get intoxicated by being young. Yay, I'm young and strong, get out of my way, I'm going to do what I want. You get intoxicated by youth, yeah? Or you get intoxicated by being healthy. You forget that the body is, has a nature to get sick, and so you're intoxicated by being healthy. Yeah, I'm healthy, I never get sick. Yeah? and whatever. You're intoxicated by life, yeah? But also, one of the big intoxications is the intoxications of the five sense world. 
these five senses, yeah? We enjoy it. We forget the downside. We forget the drawbacks. And as, just as we are forgetting the, the downside and drawbacks, just at that time, the other fellow comes with the axe, yeah? To chop down that tree. And in the middle of our intoxication, we and you have to endure an enormous amount of suffering when we fall out of that tree here. And maybe we die or we have death-like suffering here. And this is the reality of the five sense world. We forget up and down. We forget what is important. And often when we forget what is important, because we are intoxicated by that world, we do stupid things. Yeah, that's what happens when we are intoxicated by that world. We think, yeah, if I cheat a little bit, if I do some naughty things, yeah, if I... Uh, you know, don't kind of pay and do what is right. If I lie a little bit, yeah, it's not a big deal. No one is going to get hurt, really, all that much, yeah. I'm just enjoying this life anyway. Life is such a wonderful thing. A little bit of lying is just going to increase the enjoyment, uh, yeah, because then I can get my way in the five sense world. Uh. And then, after doing a little bit of dodginess here, a little bit of dodginess there, uh, eventually you come to your deathbed, uh, and all those things that you did dodginess to get, uh, they have to go, and all you are left with is the dodginess itself. <laughs> no mangoes. The mangoes have to go. All you have left is that one time when you kind of lie to get that mango or whatever. Imagine, yeah, this is kind of what happens to many people. Everything, all the things that you lied for, that you tried to cheat for, they have to go, and all you're left with is the bad karma, the bad conscience, uh, the sense of shame that you have done something bad, and now you're dying. Imagine where that takes you into the future. Yeah, that negative mind state, that unpleasant feeling, uh, that is going to have an effect on your mind. And this is the problem if we allow ourselves to be intoxicated by that world, uh, because we forget what really matters, uh, and then we start doing stupid things. Uh. So. Uh, this is kind of the idea here. The idea is to not allow ourselves to be too intoxicated by life. Not allow ourselves when times are good in life, yeah? when things are going really well, don't get complacent. This happens very often when people, they come to the Dhamma when things are bad. You know, I'm suffering so much, please, venerable help. What, what should I do now? And then when things are going well, they never see them at all. Yeah? That's sort of like, they're gone. <laughs> Life is a bit like that, we want help when things are going badly. It's true, isn't it? Yes, so true. And, uh, but the, the wise person practices the Dhamma even in good times, because they know that these things will not last. Uh, one day the person with the axe is going to come, is going to chop down that tree, and then we have to be ready for it. Uh, yeah, we cannot really uh, be completely foolish and uh, irresponsible and stupid in our life. Uh. So that is the idea of the... Uh, tree, yeah, and the uh, tree laden with fruit. Uh, and so these are some similes how to think about the five sense world. Uh, and uh, remember that these are for reflection. Uh, they are to be thought about, contemplated. Uh, how does it apply to my life is usually a way, good way of thinking about these things. Uh, and they are not there to tell you that sensual pleasures are bad as such. You're not supposed to think sensual pleasures are bad, I must reject them. That is the wrong way to do this. Rather you reflect them on them, and as you reflect on them, that rejection happens automatically because you understand that this is problematic, and then you're doing it in the right way. But sometimes people become a bit silly. They kind of start pushing things away because I think that is what they should be doing with these similes. So please don't do that then you're going to be on the right track here. Yeah. So, are you still going to be able to enjoy your sensual pleasures after this? Yes. <laughs> Coffee. <laughs> See, I... <laughs> what was that though? Enjoy it with mindfulness, yeah, exactly. I think that is one of the, um, the tricks of that simile of the, uh, the grass torch, yeah, the idea of the grass torch. When you pick up the grass torch, not against the wind, but with the wind, uh, what does that mean? It means that you pick up the sensual pleasures not with too much attachment, but you pick them up lightly. Yeah, you enjoy the coffee, then you put it back down again quickly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is the idea. And when we can do it that way, when we can do it in a good way, then actually, of course, 
sensual pleasures is part of the life. Yeah, even if you are arahant, uh, you have to enjoy sensual. You know, sensuality is just all around us. Uh, so even an arahant will enjoy the food. Is that true? Yes. It will. <laughs> yeah. how, how do you know? You are. You... <laughs> <laughs> It is, no, you no, I'm being naughty. You are right, you are right, of course. No, you are right. The other hand enjoys their food, right? This is the point. And they say that when you come out of a deep state of meditation, you actually enjoy the things of the world more because your mind is very clear, your mind is powerful, you don't have the craving. The craving destroys your ability to enjoy anything because you're not in the moment, yeah? You're not really present. So craving is a bad thing, yeah? And so the person who comes out of a jhana state, they're the ones who really enjoy they can really enjoy things, they can really enjoy the coffee, but they can also let go, because they don't hold on to those things. That's kind of the power, yeah? So you enjoy it, then you can let go straight away, you don't crave for it. You know what lies beyond, you know what is superior, yeah? And that is kind of the point of these things. Yeah? So please take these things in the right way, yeah? And then they will be very, very useful. Yeah? If you take them in the wrong way, like everything else, it can become a problem. Yeah? Don't make it a problem. Okay. Mm. Wake up. Okay. So, now just to finish off this um, sutta, just kind of uh, again just uh, do the last part here, like we did before, having truly seen this with right understanding. Yeah. They reject equanimity based on diversity and develop only equanimity based on unity. Yeah, so right understanding is kind of the critical thing here. You have to understand things rightly and fully. That right understanding is what makes the path go forward. Every factor of the path has to be right. Yeah, right view, right intention, right understanding, etc. Sammanyana, I don't know, what, what is the path here? Samapanya. Samapanya, really? Okay, that's pretty cool. Samapanya, right, right wisdom. Okay, that's a nice one. Having true the sinners right wisdom, yeah, then you reject the diversity because diversity, you're still in the five sense world uh, and you understand that it is not really worthwhile and you go to something higher and you develop the uh, ekata upeka, the unit, the uh, uh, equanimity based on unity, where all kinds of grasping to the worldly pleasures of the flesh cease without anything left over. There's zero left over. So that is what happens if you take this all the way to the end. That's what the Buddha says. So even if you don't take it all the way to the end, the point is that a little bit of understanding of this will help you to be a more peaceful person, will help you to not to take that world so seriously. It will help you to be a better person, more kind, more generous, it will make your meditation a bit more peaceful. Everything will come together a little bit more, if you understand a little bit. If you understand a little bit more, things will come together a little bit more. And thus, higher and higher, depending on how deeply you understand these similes, how much you make of them, how much you reflect on them. Yeah, This is kind of the idea here. So, uh, yes. Mm. Okay. So uh, that is uh, the similes on uh, uh, non-sensuality, uh, how to overcome uh, the holding on to the sensual pleasures. Uh, and now what we have looked at so far, we have looked at uh, uh, some of the perceptions that relate to uh, not having ill will, not having harm, not being harmful, uh, non-sensuality. And these are like the three uh, perceptions that relate to the three intentions of the Noble Eightfold Path, Samma, Sankappa, yeah? The three right intentions are intentions of non-ill will, in other words, metta, the intention of non-harming, which is karuna, compassion, and then the intentions of renunciation, which is the intention of uh, not being attached to the sensuality of the world. So these are very important perceptions, uh, and if I were to give you some advice on what you should develop most, uh, develop things that have to do with metta, yeah, and see the good qualities in other people. Overcome that little bit of ill will that maybe you still have left. Uh, if you haven't got any ill will, congratulations. Uh, but most people have at least got a little bit that they need to deal with. Uh, so deal with that. Uh, yeah, And uh, when the ill will is gone, you can still develop the metta further. So keep on developing these good qualities. Uh, 
And uh, this is, I think, the most important thing of all to do. Uh, and then uh, as a bonus, if you want to contemplate these other similes, you can. Uh, but uh, overcoming ill will is the most important thing here. Yeah. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the other perceptions found in the suttas. Uh, and I'm going to co uh, focus quite a bit on the ideas of impermanence. Uh, the uh, understanding of impermanence or unreliability is really very foundational in Buddhism. Uh, and so much of uh, uh, the spiritual path emerges out of understanding impermanence. Uh, yesterday, uh, we talked a little bit about death and old age and sickness, and this is part of the idea of impermanence. Yeah, Death is like a big time impermanence. Uh, but now I'm going to kind of give you a complete overview of the, of the perception of impermanence, and Nietzsche Sandhya. Very foundational and very important. Uh, perhaps in some ways, maybe the most important of all the perceptions that we can do, because it is so broad. Uh, so uh, I'm going to look at one little sutta first of all. I just had a look at it before. I'm not sure why I included this sutta, but anyway, I did include it. Uh, sometimes when you do things, I kind of have a quick look. Yeah, this looks all right. Okay, stick it in there. Uh, and I was like, why? What is this? <laughs> you wonder what you did before. You can't really remember what you were thinking at the time. But uh, okay, anyway. So uh, this next sutta here coming up now is uh, from the Anguttara Nikaya the numerical discourses called the Anavattita Sutta. Transience, yeah? So this means, obviously, impermanence, Anavattita. And uh, numerical discourses, the book of sixes, uh, the sixth chapter, in other words, Sutta number 102. So you can see how many suttas there are in there. So lots and lots. Uh, and this is on the idea of impermanence. Uh, so let's see what the Buddha has to say about this. It's exciting, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's go up. Mendicants, seeing six benefits is quite enough to establish the perception of impermanence in all conditions without qualification. So seeing six benefits, these are called the, uh, these are called the anisangsa in Pali language, benefit. Uh, I think in Thai you have anisong, is that right? Anisong, yeah, same word. Uh, this is enough to establish the perception of impermanence, yeah, of unreliability, of uncertainty, of non-constancy. Uh, constancy, all of these words that basically mean things are out of control. That's really what it means ultimately, it's out of control. Uh, in all conditions. Uh, what does conditions mean here? Condition here is sankara, and I don't, again, again I don't agree with this translation, unfortunately, yeah. because to me a condition is a bit like a cause, uh, and this is not what it means here. Uh, it means all phenomena, really. Yes, yeah, seeing the unreliability in all phenomena, like all things, uh, in everything that we experience in the world. Uh, that's really what it means. Uh. And without qualification means without accepting anything. Yeah? Everything is to be included. Uh, yeah? So everything is part of this. Uh. So seeing six not so benefits from seeing the impermanence of all things. Uh, usually we only see drawbacks, uh, but actually the Buddha says the opposite, there's also benefits. Uh. So let's see what the Buddha has to say about this. Uh. First one. What six? The first one is that all phenomena will appear to me as transient. Yeah? So if you develop the perception of impermanence, then after a while things would seem impermanent. That's kind of the point. Yeah? So you develop this, you try to kind of see things in this way, you remember that things are this way, and after a while this is actually how you start to see the world. It becomes your natural inclination of the mind. Uh, you start to understand that things actually are impermanent. Uh, yeah? And it becomes how you relate to everything in the world. You relate to things uh, with this at the back of your mind, uh, seeing that all phenomena are impermanent and transient. Uh, yeah? This is very, very, very useful because it means that you don't attach so much anymore. Uh, yeah? If you really understand that at every time, attachment is really reduced. Uh, and when attachment is reduced, uh, and you're not holding on, uh, it means again that your meditation becomes more powerful. Uh, 
It means that you have a more happy life because you don't become so distressed when things go wrong and all these kind of things. So you will actually start to see things as a transient. You are aligning your mind with the reality of things. Instead of your mind being opposed to reality, most human minds are opposed to the reality of the world. We think of the world in one way, the world is actually in a different way. We saw this before. You see permanence and the impermanent. You see a self in non-self. You see happiness and suffering, etc., etc. Yeah, we are opposed to reality all the time. So instead of being opposed to reality, which is bound to lead to suffering because you don't see things in the right way, we align the mind with the reality. And after a while, the mind becomes like that. You start seeing transient and impermanence. You think, oh yeah, be careful, yeah, watch out, don't hold on too much. Okay, I recognize this, things are transient. So this is kind of the advantage here. You might get I think that this is uh, this is one of those things. Yeah, what what do we mean by impermanence? And uh, sometimes when we talk about impermanence, we think about it like that. Yeah, I think you get dizzy because things are just coming and going all the time. Uh, but this is kind of what often when they talk about inside vipassana meditation. Uh, and when they do vipassana meditation, the idea is to see the constant flux in your mind, things coming and going all the time. Uh, but this kind of impermanence here is actually much broader than that. This is just the changeability of everything in the world. Not just when you sit in meditation and you see your mind changing all the time. That's just one particular kind of impermanence. Here is like a general impermanence, yeah? So thank you for bringing up that point, Venable, because this allows me to expand on the point. Yeah, it's a general kind of impermanence where everything around us is always changing and moving. Yeah? In the suttas, the Buddha says that, well, if you should take you know, sometimes we think, if, if, you, if I'm going to ask you, who is the real you? And most likely you will say, my mind is the real me. Yeah? That's the real me. Okay, the body. We understand the body is not the real me because the body has to kind of die. Yeah? And you can kind of chop off a finger and you're still there, so you can't be real. Yeah? Uh, so the mind, that's the real me, right? That's the real me. Yeah? But the Buddha said, actually, if you should take anything as the real you, you should take the body. Because the body, at least, it lasts for... I don't know, my body has lasted for almost 60 years now, yeah, and I don't know how long, I'm not going to ask you how old you are, but, uh, you know, whatever, whatever, it, whatever it is, right? And so, uh, you, so the body at least has a certain stability to it, but the mind is always kind of moving around, it's always kind of changeable now. And uh, so, uh, so, and so, but still, the body is still impermanent. Uh, yeah, so we see the impermanence of the body. We see this building at the BGF. Okay, it lasts for quite a long time, but uh, eventually it will crumble and decay. Yeah? You can probably see the decay already. Yeah? Yeah, this building was bought only a few years ago. It was built up. It's a very beautiful building. Yeah? You come on the outside, yeah, the colors. Uh, it's really well done, actually. Congratulations, BGF. Uh, you made a beautiful building. Yeah? Especially if you look at the rest of the neighborhood. Not so beautiful, right? <laughs> <laughs> This building kind of stands out. It's kind of, good, kind of, it's a little diamond in the rest of the neighborhood here. But still, and then it starts falling apart, right? The paint kind of, you get kind of marks on the wall, blotches, and soon enough you have to repaint it and fix it up. Then you start to get cracks in the wall. Yeah, maybe you get all kind of things are starting to slowly disintegrate. And when you see that the building disintegrating, don't think, oh no, think, oh yes. <laughs> Yeah, oh yes, of course, the building is disintegrating. Okay, yeah, absolutely. I rem you know, and so don't, don't try too hard to repair it straight away. Yeah? Because that's an endless job, the repairing. Yeah? Much more important to meditate, right? To get the meditation out of the way, the repair of the building can always wait. Uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, Bobby, I'm probably now saying things I shouldn't be saying. No? <laughs> I'm turning everyone off the kind of repair work and things so, uh, as bad. But it's true, right? We should not try to have things to be too perfect, because actually it is always disintegrating and falling apart anyway. So we do enough to make it nice, enough to kind of feel at ease, but not so much as to be perfect. Perfectionists suffer enormously. Being a perfectionist is a very bad idea. Please don't be a perfectionist. Yeah? <laughs> And uh, it's just really, Adam Ram said 70%, okay, maybe 80, I don't know what the right percentage is, but uh, not to be a perfectionist. Uh, so everything around us is changing, yeah? The politics of the world is always changing. Yeah? 
if you feel that, oh no, this person became president already, you're kind of thinking in the wrong way. Because of course, it is impermanent, yeah? But we have a kind of, you know, the world is going through different phases. Sometimes you have dictatorship, sometimes you have democracy, sometimes you have kings, sometimes you have all this kind of different kind of government. And then you think the governing structure is changing, the politics are changing. Of course they are changing. It's to be expected. Everything is changing. The schooling system that we have, yeah, our ability to pay for good education, the quality of the teachers, the hospitals, everything is always moving around. And one day the hospital may be gone and we have to look after each other again, like they did in the old days. Things are always moving. Things are always changing. You can't rely on anything. You go back to the place where you were brought up. Yeah, I went back to Norway uh, like uh, a couple of years ago and I was very close to where I grew up. And uh, I not just before that, I not so long before that, I went up to the house when I was a child. I was living there from when I was nine to fifteen. Yeah, and nine to fifteen is quite an important point in your life. Yeah, you're growing up, you're kind of on the way to becoming an adult, and all these kind of things. And I remember how we were playing soccer in the streets. Yeah, going outside, and the garage door of one of the neighbors—that was the goal. Yeah, the neighbor was really angry with us, kind of coming out, chasing us away. And all this fun that we had in those days, right? And this is the fun of life, yeah, when you're young and you did all kind of bad things. I'm not going to tell you about all the bad things we did there. <laughs> and, uh, but, so I had all these kind of memories about this place. Yeah? I was a child enjoying myself. Uh, and I went back, yes, and it seemed empty here. Yeah? I didn't know anyone anymore. All the houses seemed like ghost houses, had no relationship to it. It was completely gone now. The world, I had moved on. That street had moved on. There was no relationship anymore, yeah? Everything like that is like that in the world. We have something, then we move on. It's all gone. In this life, you have relationships with a number of people. You Maybe you're married, you have parents, you have children perhaps, yeah? We are kind of live in this nexus of relationships with other people. But in your past life, those people were completely different. You had a different wife or husband. You had different kids, different parents. What about those? Aren't you sad that you have lost them? <laughs> it doesn't matter anymore, right? It's irrelevant. It's in the past. The people you have in, in this life, in your next life, are going to seem just like that. They're going to seem irrelevant. Then you will attach to someone else instead. It starts to look a bit crazy, doesn't it? When you think about it like that. And then in the life after that, then those people won't matter anymore. Then you attach to someone else. It's like we attach to all these random people from one life to the next one. And we start to wonder how real is the attachment that we have in this life? Is it really real? In the next life, I'm going to be attached to someone else. And I won't care about the people in this life anymore. Just like now, I don't care about the people in the past life. See how this kind of is so it's kind of empty when you start to look at it this way. It is insubstantial. It is not really real. And the fact that you maybe you are in this life, you have a very nice husband and wife, maybe someone you're very close to, someone you're attached to, yeah. Maybe that is the case, and that's wonderful. But still there will mean nothing in your next life. It's kind of weird. And when you start to see things like this, that it kind of macro transients. Everything is always changing. Nothing is kind of to be held on to. You start to see a kind of emptiness in everything, a hollowness. There's nothing really there. Yeah, this is the idea of non-self or the transience of all things. And uh, this is kind of the idea. Everything appears to you as transient in the external world, around us, the nature, everything is transient. The political system, the ideas, Buddhism, everything yeah, is transient. It's kind of, after a while, it's kind of scary that everything is transient. What are you going to hold on to if everything is transient? Well, that's kind of the point. There isn't anything to hold on to. And so you withdraw into yourself, into the mind, and you start to find the refuge where the Buddha said we should find the refuge which is within, in meditation practice. Uh, because that is at least reasonably stable compared to everything else. Uh, this is the kind of the, uh, the lessons to draw from this. Uh. So, uh, okay, so this is the first, yeah, the first benefit. All conditions will appear as mere transient. So it, at first it may not sound like a benefit, uh, 
it sounds almost like the opposite, like a drawback, yeah? but actually it is a benefit. Yeah? And this is what I've been trying to kind of make out just now. Yeah? Next one. My mind will not delight anywhere in the world. Yeah, yeah when everything is transient, uh, everything is impermanent, uh, everything is unreliable, how can you delight in it? Yeah? Because as soon as you delight in things that are impermanent and transient, uh, you are setting yourself up for suffering. Yeah? You think, yay, Malaysia, what a wonderful place. Yeah, I'm here, this is where I spent my whole life. Uh, and all this wonderful food here in Malaysia, especially downstairs on the bottom floor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so you delight in things, you delight in kind of all kind of stuff in this world. Uh, but you realize that you're setting yourself up for suffering every time you find delight. Uh, because delight is similar to attachment, uh, delight is similar to craving, uh, and you're craving for things that cannot be held on to. Uh. So you have to stop delighting in things in the world. Uh, yeah, instead, what do you delight in? You delight in the triple gem. You delight in meditation practice. You delight in kindness. You delight in generosity. You delight in having compassion. You delight in trying to understand other people that they are suffering too. This is what you delight in. You delight in Dhamma, basically. You delight in having the Buddha as your teacher. Wow, the Buddha showed me all these things. How lucky I am to have the greatest spiritual genius in human history as my teacher. Isn't that amazing? How did you make it here anyway? Do you know how, how did you come across this teaching and make it to this class and be able to listen to the words of Buddha? It's amazing. How did I make it here? I have no idea how I made it here, but I, all I know is I'm here right now. And I know it's transient too. <laughs> it won't last long, so I shouldn't delight too much in it. <laughs> But yeah, we are all here, and it's kind of, it's almost like a miracle that we are here. Somehow, causes and conditions have worked on us to bring us here to this point. And if you try to understand why, actually it's quite difficult to understand sometimes. If I try to understand why I'm here, actually really, really hard to understand. I shouldn't be here. I should be in Norway skiing in the snow. That's what I should be doing here. Yeah, what on earth am I doing here? That's why I like the air condition to be so low, yeah, because that, that's the kind of the last remnant of that skiing in the snow in Norway. <laughs> so yeah, so you stop. So this is kind of the idea. Yeah, we are come to this miraculous place of the Dhamma, with the Buddha, with all of these amazing things. That is what we should delight in. That is where we should find our refuge. Everything else is just too uncertain and too uh, non-delightable in that. That was a very awkward English sentence, but anyway, you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> next one. My mind will rise above the whole world. Yeah. Is that kind of a nice idea? Your mind rises above the whole world. Your mind lifts up. Your mind is so bright and so light. It's like a balloon filled with helium. The balloon rises up. And in the same way, we are buoyed by all of these light and bright mental qualities that lifts the mind up. And you feel that you are above the world. Yeah, because you are. Your mind is really beyond the ordinary world. And. Uh, one of the great similes of the Sutta that talks about the mind being lifted up in this way. And this is a simile I haven't given you here, but it's still a very beautiful simile. And it's a simile when a, a novice monk, I think his name is Agivesana, and Agivesana, this prince, comes to meet Agivesana. And this prince, what's his, his name again now? Um, can't remember the name of this prince, it's in Majjhimanika 125. What is the name of this prince? Er, I, okay, I know that uh, someone is going to tell me soon for the name of the No, you're not going to tell me soon? Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, I was hoping that I would be, be helped. No, it doesn't know me, we don't need to know the name of the prince. It's a prince, yeah, it's a random prince. So, so this prince comes to Agivesana, and the prince says to Agivesana, well, tell me, I have heard that there's something called Samadhi, yeah? Is that true? And I was like, yes, it is true. Well, I don't believe it. Can you explain it to me? And I gave this, and I said, well, I'm just a new monk. I can't really explain these things. Uh, you know, better ask me. And, no, no, please explain. I want to know. Okay, he says, but don't take it too seriously. If I can't, you know, you can't explain it properly. And so then he tries to explain to this prince. Uh, and what was that? Jayasena. Jayasena. 
Ah, Prince Diasena. Okay, thank you very much, Majid Mahamad 25. So, Diasena, and he tries to explain, and when he has finished explaining, Diasena says, rubbish, yeah. I don't believe a word of it. I don't believe anything you have said. It is not convincing at all, yeah. So, don't believe it. And then this monk, Agivesa, and I is really kind of downcast and really sad. He hasn't been able to explain, and the prince didn't understand anything, yeah. Just like some of you yesterday, oh, I'm more confused than ever. <laughs> I don't know who said that. Someone said that, and I thought, oh, this is bad. Yeah, I, I'm a terrible teacher. I can't even, you know, can't make it clear to anyone. Actually, many of you are enjoying it. But, uh, you know, that's kind of the thing. Sometimes you just fail to, you fail to kind of meet people in the right way. Yeah? And the, this is always going to be like that. Not everyone is going to understand. And that's okay, the way it has to be. Anyway, so Akivesa now he goes to the Buddha and he tells the Buddha what happened. And the Buddha tells him, well, if you had remembered these two similes, uh, yeah, then you would have been, you were probably convinced Prince Jayasena. And then Akivesa now he says, well, how could I possibly have come up with these similes when they are spoken by you, Venerable Sir, by the Buddha? And then the Buddha says, well, you know, these two similes, and one of them is about the gradual training of an elephant, uh, and the other one is about the mountain peak. Yeah, it's a beautiful simile of the mountain. Uh, and the simile is as follows. Uh, there's two friends walking through the jungle or the forest. Uh, and the forest is always the simile for the five senses, the five sense world. Uh, very hard to get out of, very dense, very thick. Uh, and then when they walk through the forest or the five senses, uh, they come to a mountain, uh, or like a hill, yeah? And then when they come to the hill, one friend says to the other one, let's walk to the top. And the other one says, nah, I couldn't be bothered. Yeah? That's what they say in Australia, nah, I couldn't be bothered. Yeah? <laughs> so, he, so he remains at the bottom, yeah? and the other friend, he walks to the top. And then when he walks to the top, he looks out and he says, wow, right? And looking out from this mountain, and he shouts down to his friend, wow, you wouldn't believe it, yeah, our friend down there. Up, up here, I can see the fields, I can see the roads, I can see the rivers. Everything is so beautiful, I can see the whole landscape around. And then the friend at the bottom says, I don't believe a word of what you're saying. It's complete nonsense, yeah? And then, of course, the friend at the top of the mountain is getting a bit exasperated, yeah? With this kind of friend on the bottom. But what kind of friend is that who doesn't believe you anyway? Kind of a dodgy, dodgy friend, right? <laughs> so it goes... From the top of the mountain, he goes down to the bottom and he grabs his friend by the arm, pulls him up to the top of the mountain and says, look, <laughs> what do you see? And, oh yeah, I see, <clears throat> I see fields, I see roads, I see the beautiful landscape. You were right. Okay, so why just now did you say you didn't believe me? Oh, I said it's because this big mountain was in the way. That's why I didn't believe you. <laughs> And the big mountain, what is that? The big mountain is a symbol for the five hindrances. Yeah? The five hindrances block your ability to really see the view. And the view is samadhi. Samadhi is where you rise up above everything in, in, uh, around you. Rise up above the five senses. You get the bird's eye view. You can see everything below. You understand what is going on. For the first time in your life, you have a perspective, the bird's eye view, on what the five sense world actually is like. Yeah? That is the idea of the simile. Yeah, so your mind arises above the whole world. It understands what is going on. It has extracted itself from those five senses. The five senses are completely gone, and only when they are completely gone is it possible to understand what they are. And this is a beautiful simile which you will hear from people like Ajahn Brahm sometimes. If you want to understand something, the only way you can understand something is by withdrawing from that thing. It's like the tadpole and the frog. Yeah, Ajahn Brahm uses this simile all the time. If you are a tadpole, can you understand water? No, because you've always been in water, so you have nothing to compare it with that. But the day the tadpole becomes a frog, jumps out of the water, the frog thinks, oh yeah, that was water. Yeah, now I know what water was. I don't know if frogs think that, but anyway, it might think that, yeah? And then you can understand what it is. And the same thing with the five sense world. You can really only fully understand it once you extract yourself from that world. And that extraction happens slowly. It happens as your meditation deepens. You understand a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then finally, fully, when you have risen above the whole world, the mind is released from those five senses. And that will be the most powerful, amazing, meaningful, blissful experience 
that the person has ever had when that happens. So, because it is utterly extraordinary and different from anything else. So. Let's do some more meditation together now. Before that, uh, Ajahn, we keep talking about the five sense world. What about the six sense? Six sense world. Right? Six sense world. Yeah. Okay. So, what is the six sense uh, in uh, Buddhism? Right? Okay. So, uh, you know, all know what the five senses are, right? Five senses: eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body. Physical sense. Uh, yeah, five senses. Uh, and uh, in Buddhism, we also have the six sense, which is the six of the six sense of the mind. Uh, and uh, the sense of the mind is uh, kind of separate because it's in the sense of the mind that is where you can rise above the whole world. Uh, that's where you can experience these kind of blisses and all these kind of things. So, so you want to, uh, uh, the idea here is to kind of get out of the five senses uh, and move to the purified mind. Uh, but uh, very often the mind also carries with it the other senses. Yeah, we experience the other senses in the mind. Uh, so for example, when you dream at night, yeah, you're not actually seeing anything, but you're still seeing with the mind. Yeah? The mind is seeing the dreams, uh, or you're having interactions in your sleep. So the mind also carries with it the other senses. Uh, so first of all, we have to let go of the five senses, then we have to let go of the senses as they appear in the mind, uh, and then we get the purified mind consciousness. Uh, and that is what you know where we get into samadhi and these kind of things. Uh, there's a bit of a, uh, there's many steps to this. Uh, Okay, please. Uh. Hello, Vajan. Um, before I pose my question, I would like to apologize to Bhante Sujato. Um, <laughs> I, this phrase, um, what, reject equanimity based on diversity and develop only the equanimity based on unity, it's a mouthful. Mm. Can you... <laughs> Bring it down to more. Yeah. Um, Other translations, sir. Oh dear. No, no, Aja, in your own language. In my words, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Very, very, it's more relatable. All right. So what it means? Okay. So what it means is that you, uh, you know, you are like walking through the daily life, but you're not really being attracted to things or things that your mind is kind of even. Yeah. Your mind is even in the daily life. You don't kind of go around craving a lot or getting angry or whatever. You have this mindful mind. You have mindfulness in daily life. Yes, yeah? that's what it means in a sense. You have mindfulness in daily life, uh, and that is called uh, the uh, equanimity based on diversity. Uh, yeah, mindfulness in daily life is equanimity based on diversity because you are aware, you're not allowing yourself to be drawn in or rejecting and these kind of things, not getting very angry about things, or you have this evenness of mind in daily life. It's called based on diversity because the six senses are still operating. That's why it's called diversity. Yeah. yeah? So it is the equanimity in daily life, the equanimity when the six senses are operating. Yeah? But then you realize that actually that is kind of dangerous. The reason why it's dangerous is because uh, you are still immersed in this world which is impermanent and unreliable. Uh, yeah? You don't really want to have anything to do with that world anymore. You're kind of fed up with that world. Uh, and you realize you want to find the refuge inside instead. Uh, yeah? And that's what it meant by rejecting that world. Actually, I don't interest in that world anymore. Yeah? I don't really, that world is kind of yucky because it is so unreliable and so uncertain. Uh, and so you kind of give it up completely. And when you give it up, that's when meditation becomes possible. Uh, like really deep meditation and that deep meditation will eventually take you to the mind is completely unified the five senses are gone all that is left is the mind and the mind is completely unified means that it is still yeah not moving anywhere not doing anything it's like when you're just watching the breath and nothing else is happening just the breath remains that is a kind of unity but then you go even beyond the breath and you go to the point where all you see is like a light in the mind that all you have is a light of the mind. Everything else is gone. Uh. This is a kind of unity of the mind. Yeah, It's a oneness of the mind. Uh. And then when you develop that, keep on developing that, uh, there comes a point when you feel equanimity. Yeah, That is the equanimity based on unity. Uh. Unified equanimity through meditation practice. Uh. Does it make any sense? Uh? It's a lot of 
<laughs> Not the words. You want you want to summarize in one word. I, if you want to summarize in a few words, the best thing is to close your eyes, watch your breath, and allow it to happen. That's the best summary you can ever get. Yeah. No words required. Just experience. That's what I recommend ultimately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi again. Um, is is I remember you explained uh, regarding transients being a wider scope thing, <coughs> but I just wonder whether this sentence, uh, the, the the first of the number six, all conditions will appear to me as transient. Is it any different from? I can't remember which. Uh, Puja or Sutta that we, we always uh, chant sometimes. Uh, what? Sap, sape Sankara Anicca. Anicca, yeah. Sape Sankara Adukka, and then Sapa, Sape Dharma uh, Anatta. Anatta. Yeah. So, is there any difference between this or it's just di different words but exactly the same thing? Yeah, the difference, the difference is only that in uh, Sape Sankara Anicca, it's the Buddha telling you all things are impermanent. Yeah? So it's like the statement of the Buddha. But here, what he is saying here is that well, you, you contemplate that, you reflect on that teaching of the Buddha, and when you reflect on it, eventually that is how things will seem, will actually seem to you. Uh, so you're going from theory to practical application, theory to practice. When the Buddha says all things are impermanent, okay, then it's like faith, you take the word on faith. Uh, but if you keep on developing that, eventually that is actually how things see, look to you. You see the world in that way. Yeah? All phenomena appear to you as impermanent and transient. So, so you see the difference? So, so this is the practice? Well, this is what, when you keep on practicing, this is how it ends up. Yeah? So this is why at the very beginning of the sutta it says, uh, seeing six benefits uh, is enough to establish the perception of impermanence. Establishing the perception of impermanence, that is the practice. So you keep on contemplating it, you keep on contemplating seeing impermanence around you, and eventually as you do that, one day, actually you start looking around, everything looks impermanent, yeah? Because of that. That's when you have, uh, you have uh, got the result, if you like, of that practice, yeah. yeah. Um, over there, yeah, yeah. Because, ah, there you are, venerable. Okay, please. Uh, on the, uh, you just know, about the uh, equanimity in diversity. Ah. Uh, it, it's also good, isn't it? Of course, it's good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah. So you know when mm. you in the world, not in the meditation, yeah. nobody will be. In meditation at you know all the time mm. but then when you repent with the, when you live in the world if it, whatever arise whatever happen then if we have a equanimity that would be good right absolutely yeah it's good it's a good thing so you it is uh, this is the thing it's like stage one the one stage by stage so, so that is a preliminary stage and then take it deeper later on yeah yeah. yeah. And also, the, yeah. we, what you said uh, before we mm. talk for meditation is that uh, you said if you go beyond the five senses, yeah. or the six senses, or five senses, yeah. and then and it will be, you know, uh, a, what do you say? <laughs> what did you say? Blissful, happy. It would be, yeah, very happy out of this yeah. world. Maybe that's why the saying came about. But if you don't have eyes, you know, if you don't have ears, if you cannot hear or you cannot see, then, uh, you know, mm. you would be happy. Right? Yeah, yeah. Right? You yeah. said. Yes. There, there was a monk, sure. I heard a monk yeah. was talking about that and I asked you. And you said, and yeah, there's the truth to it. Do you remember? Mm. Of course it's true, yeah. Dep depends on, 
It depends what you mean. It's not just about not having eyes, it's about having samadhi. Yeah, yeah. yeah so but no, how, yeah. It depends on how you don't have eyes. I think the, the context was taking out in the wrong way from what you said that, you know, the experience, if you go beyond the five senses, yeah. it will be, you know, wonderful. Yeah. Then you take out like, if you don't have, if you don't, cannot see, cannot hear, then you will be happy. Yeah. Sure. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not as simple as that. It's not about not seeing anything, it's about attending samadhi, yeah. Yeah. So through samadhi, through the spiritual practice, not seeing, yeah. Huh? Not just kind of, not just taking out the eye. Right. But then there was the mom was teaching yeah. something like that. That's about teaching. Yeah. 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 That's why I was taking yeah. in the, you know, yeah, yeah. the so wrong That's, that's ab absolutely the wrong way. Yeah. And yeah, that's not enough just to kind of get rid of the senses. That's, that's certainly uh -huh. not the case. So, yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, hi, Ajahn. Hi. So, uh, that part that says without qualification, yeah. that means that there is a un right understanding already, so there is no need to qualify the, 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 the all impermanence of all conditions. That means there is a right understanding already. Is that so? I think it means that you, uh, you see impermanence and you don't make any exception. I think that's what it means. Everything is included in the idea of impermanence. You see it everywhere. No kind of exception. Yeah. Thank you, Ashan. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, talking about this uh, contact with eye, with sight, eye consciousness, mm -hmm. then contact arises. How does that work with the sixth sense then? What is the, the three equivalent that make up passer in the sixth sense and what is passer in the sixth sense yeah so in that case it is uh, you know it is just a an idea in the mind yeah an idea something that some object of the mind uh, and then the mind consciousness the ability to be aware in the mind uh, and when those two things come together then there is a uh, uh, there is contact happening here it's a bit, it becomes a bit tricky because if you use those exact same elements, yeah, the mind consciousness in a sense is already there, that's kind of part of the mind, so you can't really talk about mind consciousness in addition to the other thing. Uh, uh, I'm sure the Abhidhamma has a very kind of, a, has some kind of explanation for this, yeah, but uh, I'm not so interested myself in those Abhidhamma explanations. Uh, but basically there, just the, well, you have the mind the consciousness, the awareness, and that awareness of the mind can take different objects. Uh, yeah, it can be the first jhana or the second jhana, right? Different object, uh, or it can be in something else. Uh, that is kind of the uh, uh, the difference there between awareness and, and uh, the object uh, in those situations. And just wondering whether we could just say the eye is basically the activity of the mind, uh, and the sight is basically a thought arising, and this eye consciousness uh, is the equivalent in in a success would be attention. Oh, awareness. Uh, awareness, yeah, yeah. So the the eye, it was say again, what was it what you're saying? The eye is okay, one. The eye is the object of the eye would the equivalent would be the mind, which is not a physical so, object. So the mind is the eye. The eye, and yes. The, and the thought the is the object. Arising so, is the sight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. The, but the question is what is eye consciousness? Is it yeah. attention or awareness? And but, then yeah. that being the case, what is passer then? Yeah, well, I, I, well I, think, I think the thing is that if you have the mind already, because the mind is already there, attention always is already part of the mind, yeah? so it comes with the mind. Yeah? You can't have mind without attention, yeah? because it's, that's kind of one of the definitions of mind, is that you have that ability to attend to something. Yeah? And so I think it's kind of implied already. So I think it becomes very artificial when you start looking at the mind. Yeah? So, uh, yeah, so passa is just... Um, the mind is present and then a particular object comes into, you know, you're focusing on that particular thought and that focusing on the thought, that is what allows the contact to happen. That's when you experience the thought. Uh, but uh, you could argue that without the experience of the thought, the thought doesn't exist anyway. Yeah? So you, the, thought, if the very existence of the thought means that you're experiencing it. So in terms of the mind, I would say that the object and the passa is the same thing. 
because they can only exist. Uh, yeah, the thought can only exist if you are aware of it. If it's not aware of it, how can, how can you say the thought exists? It doesn't exist. Uh, so it, it becomes very, it becomes artificial and funny when you start looking at the mind in that way. So yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. Never figure it out. Yeah. So and I, maybe it's not, not really necessary because uh, you, we know still we know what it means, right? I mean, from an experiential point of view, it's kind of obvious you're aware of what's going on, and that has a feeling, and then you kind of the whole sequence of dependent origination or perception happens as a consequence of that. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, go, I think better go to the other of my class and find you guys. <laughs> I remember when I was here a few years ago, they had the Abhidhamma class. I was staying in the room behind me, the Abhidhamma, and I was told in the afternoon today, no Sutta class because Abhidhamma is going to be going on. So we had to cancel the Sutta class today. I was really upset, right? How can they cancel the Sutta to listen to Abhidhamma? I thought this is kind of... <laughs> no, I wasn't very upset. But anyway, they had this Abhidhamma, and there was more people coming to the Abhidhamma than to the Sutta class. That's when I got really kind of... I was really getting worried about the VGS because more people going to the Abhidhamma than the Sutta. That's kind of always a, was a bad sign, yeah? And not only that, but they were very loud. So I was trying to rest back there. But they had the microphone on really loudly, listening to Abhidhamma. I thought, Wow, this is kind of everything bad coming together in one go. <laughs> so that was a, that was very interesting. Yeah. Anyway, I'm just messing around with you, so don't take it too seriously. Yeah. Um, let's uh, do a little bit more of the sutta, and then we come back to the uh, Q and A afterwards. Uh,